All right. Well, as uh, participants continue to trickle in, we're going to um, begin our presentation, our webinar. So good morning and welcome to this morning's webinar about the Asian longhorn tick. Um, my name is Dustin Weaver and I serve as the Deputy State Veterinarian here in Georgia. I'll be facilitating uh, this meeting and we'll also be monitoring our, our questions and chat. Um, a few housekeeping items before we start, please submit your questions to the Q&A and I'll forward the questions, time permitting, um, to our presenter, Dr. Yabsley. Um, this webinar is being recorded so we can um, distribute and, uh, and distribute this presentation further. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Yabsley. Dr. Yabsley is a professor at the University of Georgia and earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in wildlife sciences and parasitology from Clemson University, University before earning his PhD in parasitology from the University of Georgia. Dr. Yabsley enjoys teaching and mentoring students of all programs through an interdisciplinary One Health approach as he teaches the human, environmental, and animal connection. Today's presentation is being put on through a collaborative effort uh, between the Georgia Department of Agriculture and the University of Georgia. And so with that, I'll leave us in the very capable hands of Dr. Yabsley. Dr. Yabsley. <clears throat> thanks, thanks, Dustin, for that introduction. And thanks everybody for coming, either for the first time or the second. Uh, hopefully today will go much smoother. I appreciate you spending your morning with me as we talk about uh, just general information about the Asian longhorn tick and then what's going on here in Georgia. So many of you are probably here because in September, this memo went out from the Georgia Department of Agriculture um, documenting the first detection of this tick here in Georgia. So um, towards the end, I'm gonna talk about some of the specifics about what's going on here in Georgia and what we are doing and what others are doing related to that detection. Um, but first I wanna spend some time going through um, some of the basics about what is this tick. So this tick is Haemophysalis longicornis, or the Asian longhorn tick. If you're in Australia, it's called a cattle bush tick. Um, so this tick is native to Southeast Asia, where it's a serious pest of livestock um, in its native range and also several regions in the um, uh, Australasian region where it's been introduced. Within these areas, um, tick numbers can get quite high on cattle and cause stress, reduce growth, and reduce production. And then in extreme cases, um, it can cause sanguination. So just essentially a, a loss of so much blood that these animals can die. So scientifically, what's really interesting about this tick is that it can reproduce parthenogenetically. So typically when you have a female tick that lays eggs, half of those eggs will be males, half will be females. And then of course they mate and the female lays eggs. But in this particular case, the females can lay eggs without mating with a male and then all of her progeny are gonna be females. So it's really easy for this tick to actually build up to really high numbers because every single um, uh, egg will become a female, which can then reproduce on her own without the need for a mate. And because of this parthenogenetic nature, um, unfortunately, the, that makes this tick very easy um, to invade new areas because you really only need one single tick to be introduced into a new area for her to establish a whole population of ticks. Whereas if you have ticks that require a male and a female, you have to have both. And of course, they have to come together on the same host. So with um, any tick, uh, we're always going to be concerned about pathogens that may transmit. Haemophysalis longicornis actually is known or suspected to transmit a huge diversity of pathogens. So this slide just shows you um, the diversity of parasites, bacteria, and viruses associated with this tick, primarily in its native range. Um, but just showing here in red, these are uh, pathogens that either occur in the United States or they're close relatives here in the United States that there was initial concern, of course, that this introduced tick could potentially transmit either by integrating itself into our natural system here and picking up native pathogens or potentially introducing any number of these pathogens from its native range. And then shown in green here is Tyleria orientalis, the Aikida strain. And this is a particular uh, parasite of concern for cattle producers. And I'll spend some time talking about this parasite later on because this is a pathogen that seems to have come with this tick to the US. 
So going through the history of uh, how we recognize the stick in the United States, um, it started in fall of 2017 on this sheep uh, in New Jersey. The owners noted a large number of ticks on it while they were shearing. Um, they submitted some of these ticks to a local health department who identified them as being Haemophysalis longicornis, which of course started an investigation um, to figure out where this tick came from and where exactly it occurs. So most of the efforts during that fall were concentrated on that uh, property and surrounding areas uh, because it occurred so late in the year. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot that could be done before winter set in. And with winter coming in, this particular tick does go into diapause in the environment. And so nothing much more was known uh, about this tick's uh, ecology and distribution in the fall of 2017. But as soon as spring came, folks started looking for this tick in New Jersey. And we found it on neighboring sites. We found it on wildlife. Um, other groups, of course, were uh, looking for this tick and found it in a variety of other locations in New Jersey. And then um, during 2018, it was also found in Virginia, West Virginia, and then uh, an unusual documentation of it in Arkansas, which um, then skipped a few years before it was found again. So um, most of the detections during this time frame were in the eastern United States. Folks then started looking at archive specimens of ticks that had been previously collected and either had not been identified or potentially had been identified as one of the native species of Haemophysalis that we have present in the United States. In particular, Haemophysalis laporis palustris, which is a common rabbit tick that looks um, quite similar uh, to the Asian longhorn tick, especially the immature stages of the tick. And uh, found out that this tick had been present in North Carolina um, in 2017, around the same time, it was found on that sheep in New Jersey, and that was from a possum, and those were larvae. Um, folks at Rutgers had um, samples from a dog in New Jersey back in 2013 that was subsequently identified as the Asian longhorn tick, and then samples that, uh, of larvae that had been collected from a white-tailed deer in West Virginia back in 2010 were subsequently identified as the Asian longhorn tick. So even though this tick was first found in 2017, um, we now recognize that it had been present in the United States all the way back to 2010, and that New Jersey um, likely wasn't the first place this tick occurred, although we still don't know that. So this map shows the current distribution of the Asian longhorn tick at the county level uh, outside of Georgia, the recent Georgia report. And you can see, again, most of these cases are occurring in the eastern um, parts of the country in the Northeast, Midwest, and down into the Southeastern United States. And then there's these really rare reports over in Arkansas and Missouri that are occurring. Those that are interested, um, folks here at Squidus at UGA maintain uh, this map uh, and this website where you can actually look at the different hosts and everything, all the data at the county level. We update this on a weekly basis um, using both our surveillance data that I'll talk about in a little while as well as data that's made publicly available to the USDA through their situation reports. So one of the first questions we had uh, in terms of uh, the basic ecology of this tick was where did it come from? Uh, this is obviously an exotic tick. It was introduced here at some point. And unfortunately right now, the short answer is we still don't know exactly where this tick came from. Um, but we do know that based on genetic testing that's been done, uh, in collaboration with several different groups, that there are at least three different genetic types of this tick present here. Um, and all these have been females. We do have the parthenogenetic lineage of the tick here. So there are there have been no males found in the United States. They're all females. And when we look at those females, there's three different haplotypes. So we know at least three females were introduced into the United States at some point. They could have all come in together. They could have come in separately. Uh, we don't know the answer to that. If you look at this map in the upper right hand corner, these different colored circles represent the different haplotypes. So you can see that actually haplotype, the blue haplotype is more widespread in the western part of the range, whereas the yellow haplotype is more common uh, in the eastern part, whereas H3 haplotype in red is sort of spread out all over the place. Um, but it, it still doesn't tell us whether or not these three individuals came in together or not. Um, based on these haplotypes of uh, the limited sequence available in this particular study, it suggests that it's probably East Asian origin, likely China. Uh, and this was based on testing of ticks from a number of different countries and the fact that these 
haplotypes that we've detected here predominate in East Asia. But one of my graduate students is currently um, looking at more ticks from more countries uh, and doing full genome sequencing to see if we can get better resolution on where these ticks may have come from. So early on, um, it was recognized that this tick will get on people. And so there were a number of publications that came out documenting this tick on people, um, whether or not it attaches to people and whether it was just found on them. So of course that brings up the concern that there are pathogens in these ticks that could get on people. And so researchers at the CDC have been doing a number of studies to investigate the potential of this tick to experimentally transmit different pathogens of importance to human health. And in this slide, I touch on two studies that they did with Borrelia burgdorferi, which causes Lyme disease, and then Anaplasma phagocytophilum that causes human anaplasmosis. Uh, and in both of these studies, um, the tick failed to transmit those two pathogens. So that was good news that it doesn't seem to be a good vector for the, these particular pathogens. But they did show that it could experimentally transmit Rickettsia rickettsii, which causes Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And then one of my students has been up in Virginia doing uh, a long-term surveillance project at one of the positive sites up there. And one of the things we're doing is testing ticks for different pathogens. And in that particular study, we did find that one out of the about 250 ticks that we tested were positive for Rickettsia felis. And that causes cat flea typhus in humans. Rickettsia felis is found nearly worldwide. So it's, it's present here in the United States as well. So uh, we certainly don't know whether or not this tick is just picking it up um, after it got here or if it's something that it brought with it. So what can people do um, for personal protection against ticks? Um, and this is something that we talk about a lot because uh, today I'm just talking about Haemophysalis longicornis, but uh, there are a ton of tick species out there that can get on people. And Georgia, uh, if you're native to Georgia, you know, during the summer, we have a lot of ticks. So some good recommendations to try to avoid tick exposure for yourself, and of course, pathogen exposure from that uh, would include treating your clothing or your gear with um, per permethrins. And you can either buy permethrins to treat your clothing, or you can buy actual uh, clothing that's already been impregnated with it. Um, and it'll last through a number of washes, depending on the type of product that you're using. Use um, appropriate uh, repellents um, so that when you're going out into areas that may have ticks, uh, you're going to repel those ticks. And then, of course, if you can, avoid areas with ticks. But if you're like me and you actually want to spend time outdoors and go hiking, uh, we're specifically going into areas where we know we're going to have ticks. So just take these other precautions to try to avoid getting those ticks on you. Since inevitably, um, you may end up with a tick on you. So it's a good idea when you get home to do a quick tick check. Um, check all your bits and crevices for ticks, have a friend do it too. And that way you can make sure that if you did have any ticks that got onto you, you can remove them quickly. Um, a lot of the pathogens that we are concerned about do take a bit of time to actually transmit after the tick's been attached. So getting those ticks off of you quickly is uh, very important. If you have pets, and especially if those pets have gone with you, examine them for pets, uh, for ticks. Make sure that your pets are on um, good tick preventatives. Um, products so that you can keep them healthy as well. Uh, if you can shower as soon as you come in from indoors, that'll help remove any of those ticks that may be crawling on you but haven't necessarily attached yet. And then a good idea is to put your clothes in the dryer when you get home. Uh, ticks don't do well with dry heat and just uh, running your clothes through the dryer will kill any of those loose ticks that may be crawling around. Um, there's been a good study done by folks at the CDC looking at some of the commercially available products uh, and, and whether or not they're effective in repelling the Lone Star tick. And the good news is uh, all of these products were useful. So, you know, any number of these products are things that you can easily buy in a store and they were all effective at repelling H. longicornis. And again, this is gonna be recorded. Uh, so I don't wanna sit here and go through all the details of some of these slides, but you'll be able to look at those specific uh, names later on if you're interested. So moving on from the human side and looking at animals. So both domestic animals and wildlife hosts um, are important for this tick. And this was something that we expected when this tick was first recognized here in the United States, because in Asia and introduced areas of Australia, New Zealand, this tick does occur on a huge diversity of hosts, um, which is another um, bad thing associated with this tick in terms of stability to uh, become invasive in a new area. 
you only need one female to come in and she can pretty much feed on, you know, any number of hosts that come along and successfully reproduce. So um, we, as well as uh, many, many other groups have been looking at uh, different hosts for this tick. And so this is just showing some general um, trends in terms of who we find this tick on. Uh, so keep in mind that there's going to be a, a good bit of bias um, in these types of data because people are looking at certain hosts more. But overall, uh, both dogs and cattle are commonly infested with this tick. It's also been reported on horses, goat, sheep, and even cats. And then also been a uh, few reports on chickens as well. And so it's not too surprising. Um, mammals are the more common host for this tick in other parts of the world, but it is known to occur on birds as well. Some of wildlife guys. So we've been doing a lot of wildlife surveillance. Um, other folks have been doing wildlife surveillance as well, particularly in New York and um, parts of Tennessee and um, other areas. So this just sort of collates together some of the available data from our studies as well as other published studies. And, and again, these numbers are not so important. I'm not providing you the number of individual animals that were looked at. Um, this is just showing you the number of positive individuals for each of these different groups. So really the take home message here is deer, possums and raccoons are all um, common hosts for this tick in areas where it occurs. But you can see across this entire uh, pie chart here that there's a huge diversity of hosts. Um, all sorts of meso mammals like skunks, coyotes, fox and bear, um, elk, um, which are you know, quite limited in our area, but we have found infested elk in Kentucky. Uh, rabbits have been infested with this tick, which is interesting because nearly every rabbit out there is infested with Haemophysalis leporis palustris, our native rabbit tick. So um, for rabbits in particular, you have to be careful about those identifications to make sure you, you've got the right species. Um, Folks up in New York have found it on gray squirrels. Um, a number of folks have found it on gray, uh, groundhogs. And then paramiscus. I have one here, but there's actually two reports now on paramiscus species. Um, this is where the denominator on the number of hosts becomes important. So it's only been found on a couple of paramiscus species out there, but people have looked at paramiscus a lot. Uh, and the reason is, is because paramiscus are important hosts for a number of pathogens of concern for people. And so if this tick was infesting paramiscus regularly in the wild, uh, it would increase the chances of it being able to pick up some of these important pathogens. Uh, but people have looked at a lot of paramiscus and it doesn't seem to, at least at the moment, infest that host all that much. So in addition to those mammals, um, we found it on a number of uh, birds as well. And so we've been working with wildlife rehabilitators in Virginia and a couple of other states to look at ticks that uh, are present on animals when they come in. And through that system, we found it on a number of raptors. Um, and another researcher had found this tick on a Canada goose. And so the story with these raptors is interesting. Um, a number of them were young raptors that were sort of down on the ground. Uh, and so it makes sense that these were potentially debilitated animals that were getting ticks on them because they were spending more time on the ground that maybe they should. Um, but not all of them were, so we're not really sure exactly the exposure route for some of these, but it could just simply be through uh, prey. When they uh, capture their prey, those prey items may have been infested with ticks or they just were spending time on the ground. Uh, an interesting finding that we had in New Jersey through one of our wildlife rehabilitation um, systems was the infestation of a brown booby. So it's interesting because brown boobies are not even common in that area, and it happened to be a debilitated brown booby that was very famous because um, birders, of course, want to go see unusual uh, bird sightings. And so it was a, it was an interesting finding in New Jersey. And then ultimately, it ended up being infested with Asian longhorn tick as well. All right. So earlier, I mentioned that we are particularly uh, interested in a parasite called Tyleria orientalis aikida. And that's because of its importance to the health of cattle. So in New Zealand and Australia, this parasite does cause um, significant economic losses. Uh, it can cause mortality. It's typically around 5% across all the different um, studies that have been done. Um, but of course, some individual herds will experience more mortality than others. Uh, it can cause uh, illness that could result in you know, poor food conversion or growth, milk loss. And so even if it doesn't cause outright mortality, it can be an economic um, issue for the producer. So 
in the native range and in Australia uh, and New Zealand, this pathogen was known to be transmitted by Haemophysalis longicornis. Uh, and then some research done here in the United States uh, between the USDA and Virginia Tech has confirmed that the, the uh, genetic variants of the tick that we have present here in the United States uh, can transmit the parasite that's present here as well. So um, in terms of mortality, um, or at least susceptibility to developing serious disease, it seems pregnant heifers and calves are going to be more susceptible. Um, and importantly, those cattle that do become infected but survive the infection can be carriers. So you can have a, a herd of cattle that potentially can be infected with this parasite and not necessarily show clinical disease because they're the survivors, they're chronically infected. But what they can do is maintain this infection um, to infect new ticks that then can transmit it to other individuals that may ultimately get sick. So the story about Tyleria orientalis in the United States um, was also in 2017 um, in late summer, early fall, which is actually um, right before and around the same time that this tick was first recognized in New Jersey. Um, there was a beef cattle producer in Virginia who um, reported that his, he had mortalities, about 7% total um, through the course of this um, outbreak, but his cattle presented with weakness, jaundice, anemia, so they had low numbers of red blood cells, um, they had respiratory distress, recumbency, so they were down, often near water, and then of course some of them died. Uh, some samples came here, some samples went to Virginia Tech, and ultimately this uh, parasite that you can see here in the blood smear, this is an actual blood smear from that first calf. Um, you can see these rings uh, and amoeboid stages here. Uh, all of these are quite suggestive of a pyroplasm parasite. And then through genetic sequencing, it was shown that this was in fact Tyleria orientalis. And then additional sequencing work showed that it was the Aikida strain. So this particular parasite does have multiple genotypes present um, in Asia and other parts of the world. Uh, and the Akita strain has been shown to be one of the more pathogenic strains. So um, the strain that is most concerning for the health of animals. So subsequent work on this particular farm did show that there were surviving herd mates also positive for this parasite, as we would expect. Um, and then the subsequent year in the spring, uh, Haemophysal uh, longicornis was confirmed to be on this particular farm. So like I mentioned, we've been up uh, in Virginia doing work with this tick um, since it was first recognized there. And this photo just shows one of my graduate students, Alec Thompson, doing tick drags. Uh, and you'll see some more pictures of tick drags in a little while, but essentially we just drag this cloth across the environment and stop periodically and look for ticks. Uh, and in this particular farm area, uh, we get quite a large number of Asian longhorn ticks. So these uh, environmentally collected ticks were tested for Tyleria orientalis. And you can see here about 13% of those ticks from the environment were positive for this pathogen. And so this was at the farm where the cattle were infected. So um, it was expected that this ticks would be infected, um, but 13% is actually quite high for a lot of tick-borne pathogens. And so um, there's been continued surveillance by Kevin Lamers and um, others at Virginia Tech um, looking for both the tick as well as this protozoan parasite in cattle throughout Virginia uh, and West Virginia. And you can see in this map here that there are uh, quite a number of counties in Virginia where the tick occurs. Asian longhorn tick is shown in blue. Asian longhorn tick plus Tyleria is shown in red. And then the presence of Tyleria in cattle is shown in orange. So quite a, a broad distribution in Virginia. And then he's also found it in West Virginia as well. So, um, I mentioned earlier on about 5% of cattle die. So this is a good time to remind folks that you know, there, there is this wide detection of this parasite in cattle across Virginia. Um, but right now it appears that mortality at least is limited, which is good news. But we're still fairly early on in this situation. So we're gonna obviously continue to monitor the situation. Um, and so just sort of a, a quick aside uh, that I'll talk about the Georgia data later on, but we have tested a limited number of those ticks that were found here in Georgia uh, for this parasite and they've been negative. So that's good news for now. So I spent a lot of time talking about Tyleria, one of those important pathogens for cattle associated with this tick, but I do wanna point out something that I said earlier on in that animals can present with huge numbers of these ticks on them. 
And if that does occur, uh, you can have outright mortality associated with just those large numbers of ticks. Uh, and there was such an incident in North Carolina where this is suspected to have caused uh, death of some cattle there. And these particular cows presented with huge numbers of ticks on them. And a closer picture here, you can just see that pretty much the entire um, surface of the skin is covered in these ticks. And as they engorge, you know, one individual tick doesn't take that much blood, but when you then think about thousands of ticks on these animals, they certainly can take a large uh, volume of blood. All right, um, so now I'm gonna um, switch gears and start talking about some of the uh, information for Georgia specifically, but um, maybe now's a good time. Dustin, do you have any questions that have been posted that might be related to general information? Nothing so far. I did uh, have one question for you as, as you were presenting on migratory waterfowl. Have, has there been any research in the transmission of the, the tick across, um, you know, sea boundaries through the waterfowl? Yeah, so <clears throat> that surveillance um, is limited on waterfowl for sure. Um, that detection on the Canada goose was um, just a single detection. And as you may know, you know, Canada geese can be migratory um, over long distances, but many of them are more regional migrants. And a lot of them in the South have just decided to stop migrating altogether and just hang out where they are. Um, so I'm not sure if that particular goose was one of the more migratory ones or not. Um, raptors also can move, um, you know, good distances, at least on a regional scale. Uh, and so it is a concern when they're found on these more migratory animals, such as birds. There's been quite a lot of effort put into looking at passerine birds and passerine birds may be that group that's going to potentially move a tick um, over greater distances. And there's plenty of documentation of migratory birds coming up from Central South America with ticks on them from um, that area. And there's documentation of birds arriving in Canada with ticks on them that they had acquired further south before the migration or during the migration. So there, there's plenty of information out there on the movement of ticks in general by these migratory birds. But right now, the, the work that we've done, as well as some of the work that other folks have presented on at um, some of these HL update meetings, looking at passerines, they haven't found it on them yet. Um, but it's, it's sort of tricky, right? You gotta target the right time of year. Um, you gotta target when the birds are moving from tick endemic areas to, to new areas. Uh, and those ticks need to be active in that particular region. So as this tick becomes more established, um, people will continue to do that surveillance on passerine birds as well as other birds. And I think we'll get a better understanding of their potential role. But right now it seems um, limited or we just don't know. Thank you. Yep. All right. So what's going on in Georgia? So in September of this year, um, there was a, a veterinarian called out to help deliver a calf uh, in Pickens County, Georgia. And you can see that's highlighted here in red. And uh, they noted a large number of ticks on the cow, um, reported that, um, had ticks submitted uh, for identification. And they were ultimately, of course, identified as H. longicornis. Um, and they've been both morphologically and genetically confirmed to be uh, H. longicornis. So uh, Squidus, here at UGA, as well as Georgia Department of Ag and um, other groups came together to start doing an investigation as to um, whether or not this tick was um, established on that farm. Was it that single cow or was it other cows? Was it in the environment? Was it on other hosts? Um, and then is this tick potentially more widespread in Georgia than um, is currently recognized? So in terms of environmental sampling, which is essentially dragging that cloth across the ground and looking for the tick, um, we went to that index farm in Pickens County and we did find the tick in the environment, not too surprisingly. Um, and then we also spanned out and started looking at parks and natural areas and wildlife management areas within Pickens County and a few right outside of that um, county. And those have all been negative for the ticks so far. We've been trapping wildlife um, at a nearby wildlife management area and those animals were negative for uh, the Asian longhorn tick. Uh, we've established a network of veterinarians in that region, so not just Pickens County, but all over the North Georgia to sample animals or ticks. And so that would be small animal veterinarians, large animal veterinarians, 
um, to try to understand whether or not this tick is more widespread than we currently recognize. And then we're working with the Georgia Department of Natural Resources to sample deer from the fall hunts that are occurring now. And we've used this system throughout the Eastern United States um, to sample deer. Uh, and it's worked really well in most of these areas. And you know, the unfortunate timing of this whole um, thing is that we caught this at the very end of our tick season here in Georgia. And so we're getting a lot of negatives for some of these um, efforts, but um, what we don't know is whether or not that tick just is not very active in those areas. They certainly were active on the index farm when we got up there, but as time goes on, they become less active. So here's just some pictures of some of the work that we do. Um, yeah, we don't really blend in well when we show up in our moon suits to do some of this work. Um, and so we're walking across different habitats, um, both pasture as well as wooded areas, looking for the ticks. And so our typical situation would be we drag this cloth along the ground for you know, a certain number of steps. We would flip it over. Uh, and you can see here, we would then get down and start picking off the ticks. And we would pick every one of the ticks off and collect it because we want to know how many ticks we collected across a certain distance and time, what tick species they were, because this will pick up all sorts of different tick species. Uh, and then we would have an understanding of which habitat types we were more likely to find these ticks in um, than others. We take all sorts of data, such as wind speed, temperature, humidity, and whatnot, so that we can figure out um, some of the environmental factors associated with where these ticks are occurring. Um, very quickly, we learned we were going to have to modify our typical um, system. Uh, normally, we would drag for 100 steps or so and then collect maybe one or two ticks, and that would be every couple of drags. Um, but what we quickly realized is within 10 steps um, of a drag, we would literally have hundreds to thousands of ticks on it. And so <laughs> uh, we weren't even able to collect all of the ticks on the drags. We just essentially estimated um, the large number of ticks that were present. And so this just shows uh, a fraction of the ticks that we pulled off one of our drags. As we were walking around the pasture, um, you could flip leaves over on uh, weeds and other plants, and you could just find large numbers of these ticks um, under the leaves. And then just to illustrate this point more, as you walk along, um, you can just sort of pause and look down at the ground and let your eyes start to focus. So I'll give you a second to look at this image and see if you can find any ticks. Of course, I'm showing it to you, so there are gonna be some ticks there. Um, and this was pretty much the norm in a good chunk of the pasture that we were dragging in. And so this would illustrate why we were finding so many ticks on our drags. So there's all the ticks that I found in this picture. Uh, and there are probably many, many more because this is just the ticks that are present on the top side of the blades of grass versus those that are underneath. And then also all of the ones that would be down in the leaf litter and um, in the lower areas of the grass. So a large number of ticks present at this farm for sure. Um, we tested, uh, we captured and uh, looked at a variety of wildlife species. Uh, we looked at several different rodents and they were all negative. Uh, we captured 11 possums on this farm and all 11 of them were infested. So you can see all these little brown spots here on this possum. Those are all ticks and all these dark spots on the ears, clusters of them on the possums. So a decent number of ticks on the possums. Raccoons, we would, uh, would have expected as well. Uh, we just didn't happen to catch any during our efforts up there. Uh, the owner had a couple of cats that were outdoor cats. Um, one of them was captured and um, it did have a tick on it, an Asian longhorn tick. I point that out because we found some other ticks, of course, on these animals that were not Asian longhorn ticks, but the expected native ticks. So moving forward, what can we expect in Georgia? Uh, like I mentioned earlier on, as we move into the fall, we expect tick numbers to drop off dramatically. We also expect the change in the type of tick stage that we're seeing. And so there are three different stages of this tick. There's larvae, nymphs, and adults. Uh, and the phenology data for Virginia, you can see here that during the summer months, we tend to find all of the stages. Similar data has been found in New York by some researchers up there where you find multiple stages through the summer. And then as you move into late fall, this shifts over and most of the ticks that you find are larvae. 
For surveillance purposes, that's difficult because the larvae are extremely small and very difficult to see. And so unless you're really carefully examining animals, it's very easy to miss infestations later in the fall. And so big question for us, of course, for research question is whether or not this phenology is gonna differ in Georgia. We have a longer season of warmth down here. So are these ticks gonna persist and be active um, in the environment longer? Will they come out earlier in the spring than some areas um, to our north? There have been times in Georgia where we'll have several days of 70 degree weather in January, and all of a sudden people will start submitting ticks to me, uh, Lone Star ticks, Amblyoma americanum, which typically are not active in the winter, but if you've got several days in a row of warmth, they'll actually come out and start questing. So a big question is here in Georgia, if we do have some of those mild winters with some unusually warm periods, will these ticks actually come out in the winter? Um, and then, not to be a downer, right, but <laughs> the hope was when this tick was first found in the fall of 2017 that the winter would kill it off and we wouldn't see uh, the tick the next year, and that certainly has not been the case. So we have no reason to believe that this tick is not going to come back out in the spring here in Georgia as well. So what can you do? Um, and so hopefully through this talk and then resources that you can get um, related to ticks, uh, know when and where to expect ticks. Uh, and so, of course, with this particular tick, it's hard to know where to expect it in Georgia because uh, we don't know the extent of where it occurs, but that's why we're doing surveillance. So just be tick aware, um, monitor your animals for ticks, um, call people if you have unusual uh, infestation numbers. We have a large number of native ticks here that can get on cattle and other animals, um, and lone star ticks can actually occur in, in decent numbers on animals as well during the summer. So it may not necessarily be the Asian longhorn tick, but it's always better safe than sorry. If you um, see something unusual, certainly collect and report so that people can follow up with it because um, it may be an incident where it is actually the Asian longhorn tick. Uh, monitor animals for signs of tick-borne disease. It's easier said than done. Most of these are going to present with um, very um, uh, general signs of lethargy, uh, not eating well, losing weight being down and not wanting to move around, respiratory signs. So essentially just monitor your animals for uh, signs of illness and certainly talk to a veterinarian to get uh, workups done. Um, approaching this from an integrative pest management um, approach uh, to try to minimize the numbers of ticks present. Um, so that could include treatment of animals, individual animals, environmental modifications and treatment of the environment. So, um, why treat? Um, first of all, you know, we have dealt with ticks on animals forever. Um, and so a lot of people sort of just dismiss ticks and they're like, yeah, there's a few ticks out there, no big deal. Um, and, you know, historically, um, that has been the case for a lot of these situations. But in this particular situation, because hemophysalis can result in mortality and sickness due to high numbers on uh, animals, it's a good idea to have a, a a treatment plan in place if this tick is uh, detected in the area. As I mentioned earlier, right now, we don't have any evidence of Tyleri orientalis being in Georgia, but um, more surveillance is needed and certainly that can change in the future. So um, I'm not gonna get into um, details about what specifically people should be using, how they should be using it and when they should be using it because ultimately um, the best person to talk to about that would be your veterinarian because there are a lot of options out there, um, and a lot of those options will work well for you. Um, but depending on your situation, some may be better than others. And I certainly can't speak to the huge diversity of uh, situations that you may be facing. But there are a large number of spray and dip um, options available commercially. Um, and these are approved for use on cattle. Uh, and they are very effective at killing or minimizing the numbers of ticks present on these animals. And so while many of them have not been evaluated specifically for um, H. longicornis, they do work against a large number of tick species and so presumably would work well for Asian longhorn tick as well. Um, the cattle fever tick program um, has additional options that people use, um, but those are not necessarily something that are easy to implement. For example, the use of doramectin would require um, injectable doramectin on a monthly basis for many, many months. Of course, that's specific to the cattle tick. Um, and so the situation may be different for the Asian longhorn tick, but that hasn't been evaluated. 
Um, there are a number of uh, options out there for ear tags and back rubbers. Those also have not been evaluated for Asian longhorn tick. And I would um, say that uh, it would be good to exercise caution, thinking that they're going to be 100% useful for you, um, simply because they're really effective at controlling ticks in the general area of where those products go, but they may not necessarily um, provide full body protection. And with these cattle, they tend to have ticks present all over them. So going for these dips or sprays where you can actually control where the product is going would be um, probably more useful. But again, um, research is going to be done on these and maybe they'll be found to be useful. So um, if you got the tick on your property, um, you probably are going to have to do repeated treatments. So a single treatment in the spring when these ticks are emerging um, likely will not be sufficient to uh, you know, remove this tick from your environment and from all of your animals. Uh, and so you do need to continue to monitor the situation because you may need to treat um, again. And then the thing is, all of these products have limitations on their use. Um, and so it's very important to read those labels, speak to your veterinarian about the labels and what sort of regulations there may be in terms of um, product removal for milk and meat um, and use on different ages in particular. And then anybody who is an organic producer, of course, are going to have more limitations put on them. And so certainly you want to investigate any of those limitations. Um, there has been a study um, out of the folks at Tennessee, um, Becky trout Frixall looked at the use of a number of different commercially available products to kill um, Asian longhorn ticks in the lab. And so these are products that are commonly used on cattle. And so as you can see here, the good news is that all of these products, with the exception of one, killed the ticks in the lab very quickly, less than an hour. And even the one that didn't kill it in less than an hour actually killed them in less than 24 hours. And so um, this is really good news that all of these products that are labeled for use on cattle that kill ticks um, were working well uh, in the lab to kill Asian longhorn tick and so should work well uh, in the field as well. Uh, in terms of environmental modification, the general recommendation is to, you know, mow your grass short um, to minimize the numbers of ticks that may be present within a pasture or a given area. Um, this particular tick does like the longer grass. It does well in that edge habitat between the pasture and forest land, but it has also been found in uh, areas with short grass as well. So we don't 100% know how effective it will be to maintain a pasture with short grass. Um, of course, your situation may be that you don't want to have short grass in your pasture, so that's not an option for you. Um, the infested farm here in Georgia has a mixture uh, and certainly has areas with um, very low grass, and we are still finding the ticks in those areas. We are finding far fewer ticks in those areas, but um, they were still present. So, you know, keeping your grass short may help to minimize uh, that really good habitat for the tick and may minimize the numbers of ticks that are present in the habitat and then would be available to get on animals. If you can limit access um, to uh, wooded areas or brushy areas or any areas with high grass, um, and that could just simply be excluding the cattle from going into those areas or putting at least a, a fence barrier to um, not allow them to go into that area. And then if you're not able to do that, maybe remove brushy areas or woody debris that would um, allow some of these wildlife hosts to come in and use those areas because they would be potentially maintaining that tick in the area. And so um, again, not to be a downer, but you know, all of these are gonna be useful um, tools to help minimize the number of ticks, but they're not likely gonna be solving your tick problem. You know, you're not gonna be able to mow your um, uh, field and then all of a sudden the ticks are gone. So um, if the situation is very bad, um, you can always look to environmental treatment options. Uh, and so again, this is something that you're gonna need to talk to uh, folks about what specifically would work well for your situation. Um, and that's where the label is gonna be very important. And so if you are um, spraying on pasture that's being grazed by animals, there are gonna be specific limitations on what you can and cannot use. And there's going to be specific limitations on when you can use that product. And so you need to make sure that you are following all of the rules in terms of removal of this product from the environment for a certain period of time, maybe before animals are sent off to slaughter or are being used for milk production. Um, generally speaking, though, um, for those products that are labeled for grazing land, 
Um, there is a maximum application uh, number of applications that are allowed per year, um, and that can vary from one to three depending on the product. Uh, and so what you're going to want to do is time that specifically to try to hit times of the year when the ticks are most active and at their highest numbers because spraying this into the environment when the ticks are not active is not going to result in those ticks being killed which is why going back to that phenology diagram it's not just science scientific questions we have um, that kind of information provides us really good information on when these ticks are most active in the environment so um, here are three different products that folks have used um, and i'll start with carbon World four um, it's been used in several states now for longhorn tick control, and specifically with North Carolina, they shared their experience. Um, after applying this to uh, a field, they did not find any ticks after 30 days, but after six weeks, there were ticks present. Um, and so again, it highlights the point that you're not going to kill all of the ticks that are in the environment. Any of those ticks that are not being exposed to the compound are going to be able to emerge later on. Um, so they used a second treatment to kill those larvae that were emerging after six weeks, um, and they had good tick control um, throughout that season. They were still present, um, but they um, were present in low numbers on the cattle. But then, of course, the ticks returned in spring, so they were still there. Um, and importantly, with all of these products, they are now labeled with a restriction to not use on pastures when you have weeds in bloom. Um, all of these products are going to kill bees. And so because of concerns related to bee declines, um, it's, it's labeled to not use when there are weeds in bloom, specifically because that would then target bees. Um, Paradigm VC ha has also a label claim for grazing with withdrawal times, of course. And then um, uh, this product by Frethren um, has historically been used, but recently they removed the label for grazing. So, it just highlights the fact that you know these product labels change, and so you're going to have to keep a watch on them to see what's labeled specifically for your use. You would have more options available to you for treatment if you were going to um, allow a field to remain uh, open. And so if you're going to move cattle to one field and treat um, another field, you would have more options available to you because you would not necessarily be grazing that field. All right, so. Um, to sort of start to wrap up here, I mentioned already that we have Haemophysalis leporic palustris, the rabbit tick, um, here in North America, um, specifically in the United States. Primarily, it's found on rabbits, but sometimes it'll get on deer as well. I mentioned deer simply because we tend to find uh, Asian longhorn tick commonly on deer. Um, we have the uh, elusive Haemophysalis cordialis, which is a bird tick, um, but it is very, very rarely found. And then we have Haemophysalis juxtacochi. Right now, it's predominantly uh, Mexico South tick. Um, there is one report of it being present in the United States a long time ago, but those um, individual ticks have been lost, and so confirming their identification is not possible. Um, speaking of passerine birds earlier, um, this tick has also been found on passerine birds migrating north. Um, and so what we have not uh, seen right now is an established population of Juxtacochi here in the United States uh, or in Canada. This tick uses a huge diversity of hosts, just like the Asian longhorn tick, but does prefer dogs and deer, <laughs> which actually are two of the more really common hosts for the Asian longhorn tick as well. And so moving forward, um, we actually always sort of had in the back of our mind the fact that Juxtacochi could be coming into the United States at some point. Uh, and becoming established, but um, we now have three different species of Haemophysalis that will infest similar hosts. And then, as if things weren't bad enough, um, investigating this situation, uh, researchers up uh, in the Northeast were um, looking at the Asian longhorn tick uh, and other ticks present in Rhode Island, and during some of that surveillance, they actually got Haemophysalis species uh, that did not look like Longicornis. And then when they subsequently looked at them closely and morphologically and genetically identified them, they ended up being Haemophysalis punctata, which is their red sheep tick. This is also a tick that's not native to North America. Um, it's found in throughout Europe and also infests a huge variety of hosts, although ruminants and cervids tend to be the big one. So this is the first detection of that tick um, in North America. And so it'll be interesting to see uh, what happens with this tick moving forward. 
Uh, this tick was found on Block Island, as you can see from this news article here. Uh, so it wasn't on the mainland. So hopefully it stays on Block Island. So a lot to talk about the exotic tick here in Georgia, but just again, to point out the fact that Georgia has lots of tick species here. Um, these are four of the more common ticks that we tend to see. And uh, I've shown sort of all their family portraits here because uh, the males and the females, the larvae and the nymphs all look quite different from each other, even within the same species. And so um, it's important whenever people are doing tick surveillance to collect representatives of all the different shapes, sizes, and colors, uh, because they could represent multiple species, but they could also just represent multiple stages of the same tick species. So as we move into the spring here in Georgia, lone star ticks are gonna be common throughout much of Georgia, including the area where we know the Asian longhorn tick occurs. And so we would certainly expect that tick to, to be present in that area. Um, especially on cattle. Amblium immaculatum, the Gulf Coast tick also occurs in that area. It can get on cattle. Um, during different times of the year, we may see black legged ticks uh, on deer and cattle and dogs as well. And then the dog ticks can rarely get on uh, larger mammals as well. So lots of ticks to keep an eye out for, uh, in addition to the uh, longhorn tick. And I just highlighted the Lone Star tick because this certainly is the one that is most commonly found here in Georgia, at least in that region. So just to uh, wrap up, so what can you do? One is just keep an eye out for ticks on your livestock, on your pets, on yourself, uh, and specifically look for these large numbers of ticks, which is typically how the Asian longhorn tick presents. Um, practice good um, integrated pest management to try to decrease tick populations uh, at your sites. Uh, a good resource available online is the Georgia Pest Management Handbook, and specifically on page 68. Uh, there's information on the use of different uh, labeled acaricides on cattle as well as other agricultural species. Second, um, you know, go to the trouble of collecting and submitting those ticks for identification. A lot of people don't like to deal with ticks, um, but it, it's so important, especially now that we're dealing with uh, an exotic tick in the area. So uh, there's different ways you can collect them in a tube with alcohol or ethanol. You can put them in a bag and stick them in the freezer until you can ship them. Um, but we certainly would appreciate um, having people on the ground keeping an eye out for the ticks and helping us by collecting and submitting for identification. And then third, just simply be tick aware. Um, I've talked a lot about animal health here, but we certainly have a large number of pathogens in our ticks here in Georgia. Uh, and so for your safety as well, be tick aware. With that, I'd like to thank the Georgia Department of Ag for asking me to speak to you all today and specifically Drs. Crane, Weaver, and Hennebel. Um, who have been um, great to work with on this investigation and have been working hard to help protect uh, the interest of cattle owners here in Georgia. Um, of course, the, the landowners in Pickens County who graciously allowed us onto their site um, and be quite disruptive to their days to help um, get us onto the ground to understand what's going on with this tick. And uh, tons of researchers uh, that I can't list all here who have helped with various aspects of surveillance and pathogen testing. And with that, I would be happy to answer questions. Dr. Yabsley, we have a, a couple questions that came through the chat. Um, okay. And we have a, a few minutes, so let's go ahead yep. and try to answer them. One, one question was, has there been any research in transmission of SARS-CoV-2 through the tick? Um, there, have, in Europe, actually, there's been um, a couple of groups that have tested ticks for SARS-CoV-2, and there was no evidence of that virus in there. The presumed transmission route would just simply be uh, animal to animal or person to person through uh, respiratory secretions and other bodily fluids. Okay, thank you. Um, and the next question was, is ivermectin poron effective? at killing the tick? Um, it is against other ticks, and so presumably it would be here as well. Um, but again, the control studies haven't been done, um, but uh, it, is, it is useful for other tick species. And then the final question or clarification um, was on environmental application of, uh, of control measures. Mm -hmm. And the question was asking, what does it mean that 
the AHL activity can come back that, you know, it, it's limited. Yeah. So um, I don't know if you mean within a season or between years, but, but within a season. So the thing is when you put these products into the environment, it's going to kill the ticks that are active at that time. So ticks that are moving around on the grass and on the, you know, the plants and seeking out hosts. There are a large number of ticks that are going to be found deep down in the leaf litter that just haven't become active yet, either because they just haven't yet, or it's a stage of the tick that typically is active at another time of the year. Um, and those individual ticks are not going to be killed by those environmental treatments because they're not, there's no contact um, of those ticks with the product. So those are the ticks that can come back later on. It's also possible that you've got eggs that have been laid in the environment that are protected by leaf litter. Um, and so when you apply this product, it's not going to get to the eggs. Those eggs can then hatch later, and those larvae can emerge and be active. Um, and so they wouldn't have been killed by the product either. And then as the season progresses, um, you have nymphs um, and also larvae and adults that can actually go into diapause, which means they just essentially go to sleep. Um, they shut down their metabolism, and they can hang out throughout the entire winter uh, in the leaf litter. And then when spring comes or warmer temperatures come, they can emerge and start looking for a host. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think we have room for a couple more questions that have popped up here in the chat. Is there been any work in uh, whether or not they're developing resistance to control products? Yeah, so... Not here in the United States because it hasn't been here for very long, but there's a, a long history of use of pyrethrins uh, in Asia and Australia and New Zealand to control these ticks on cattle. And there's been no documented evidence that I know of of resistance within those populations. So that's good news. Yes, it is. Um, and then finally here, how can producers, veterinarians, how can we... Uh, collect and submit these ticks? What, what options are available to us? Well, um, there are a number of different avenues that you can collect and submit ticks. Um, we have you know, options here at Georgia for ticks to be submitted to us for identification, but also I think through the Georgia Department of Ag, you have a program for ticks to be submitted to you as well. So maybe you can speak to that option. Um, but there are a number of different avenues that are free, freely available um, to have ticks submitted for identification. Yeah, uh, in a partnering effort with the Department of Public Health and with the Georgia Department of Agriculture, producers and veterinarians can submit ticks um, and there's postage that would be included in a submission form. Um, and get those ticks identified. There isn't a very rapid turnaround time, um, but it would aid us in our passive surveillance efforts. And you can reach out to the Department of Agriculture for um, tick submission vials. And with that, we've reached 930 and I really appreciate everyone's um, active participation and listening in on this webinar um, as we work together to um, raise awareness for this invasive tick species. So thank you, Dr. Yabsley, for your time. Thank you, um, attendees. And yeah. with that, we'll close this webinar. Great. Thanks, everybody.